I want to welcome you this afternoon to the Pima County Treasurer Candidates Forum. Unfortunately, we had a last minute cancellation by one of the candidates for recorder, so the forum will not be, that forum will not be formally held. But we do have the existing recorder with us today, Gabriela Cortez Kelly. I'm Barbara Becker, your moderator for this afternoon's event. Assisting me this afternoon from the League of Women Voters of Greater Tucson is our time or our timekeeper Sherry Springer and lovely Ganther Ganther. I, I know nothing like screwing up her name. Um, our question starters are Audrey Harding and Mary Davis, and our question gatherers are Stovey Wells and Linda McCabe. The League of Women Voters of Greater Tucson are pleased to present today's forum. The League is an all-volunteer organization that is committed to educating and assisting the public in a nonpartisan way to understand issues and candidates. When you sat down, you noticed you had a pencil and a three by five card. If you have a question or questions for the candidates, please write them on the cards, raise your hand real high, and we'll get your card and give it to the starters who will pass it on to the moderator. We saw it because we don't want duplicate questions asked. There are two candidates here today for treasurer, Brian Johnson and Chris Ackerley, and they'll be answering whatever questions come their way. I need to explain a few things about our process. The candidates have agreed to abide by our rules and we ask the same of the audience. First, we want you to mute your telephones and put them away. Please do not record or video any or all of this forum. We will post the forum in its entirety on the League of Women Voters of Greater Tucson's uh, Facebook, and later you can access the YouTube through our website. Second, you'll notice the timekeepers will be raising the signs being held up to tell the speaker how much time they have left to speak. Should the candidate continue beyond being stopped, I will interrupt them and so that we can ensure that everyone has an opportunity to answer each question without interruption. And third, each candidate will have two minutes to introduce themselves in their platform, a minute and a half to respond to any questions, and then two minutes in closing remarks. And we're going to road cut who goes first. Last but most importantly, we ask the audience not to clap, yell, or create any noise during the forum. We will be able to do all of that at the end. The county treasurer is an important position because that office deals with money. It collects property tax and special district taxes, accounts for expenditures of collected taxes, as well as overseeing the Pima County tax lien sales. Now let us begin the forum by each candidate having two minutes to tell themselves, tell us about themselves and why they're running for office. Brian Johnson. Thank you. Uh, my name is Brian Johnson. I'm seeking in the office of county treasurer with an aspiration to serve. My 14 years of government service in Pima County gave me an understanding of the value of service. The Office of Treasurer plays an important role in the administration of property taxes and ensuring those funds are managed and accessible to the governmental entities for which they are collected. For the schools, fire districts, community college, libraries, and other governmental services. I've identified three areas where service from the Treasurer's Office should be enhanced and improved. Prosperity, accountability, and accessibility are the keywords for those needed changes. The Treasurer's Office manages investments of public funds. I will propose a Board of Supervisors policy to align investments with the Pima County Prosperity Initiative. Accountability means more than completing audits. I will be accountable to the staff for their training and knowledge so that the service and work product from the treasurer's office attains the highest level of satisfaction from the citizens and taxpayers. Accessibility is making information available, questions answered and problems solved for citizens and taxpayers, including those who aren't voting citizens. 
This will require modernization of information systems that will integrate with other governmental offices and departments. Machine learning, artificial intelligence, and data management advances provide more security, efficiency, and accuracy than our current homegrown systems that we have. I invite you to learn more about me and my ideas at johnson4pctreasure.com. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Ackerley. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, everybody, who came out this afternoon. Um, and thank you to the League of Women Voters um, providing a space for a civil dialogue about local politics is a vitally important role um, that you play and I truly do, do, do appreciate it. I am Chris Ackerley, I am your Pima County Treasurer. I was appointed uh, back in April when Beth Ford, who had filled the position for the past 24 years, um, resigned. Um, I was gratified that the Board of Supervisors uh, in that appointment saw pass the political considerations and evaluated the experience and, and appointed me even though I was a candidate. Uh, and I was honored to have the support of 13 of the other 15 county treasurers from across the state um, in, in that appointment. Um, as the treasurer, um, I serve essentially as the president of a credit union that services the county and the 70 plus jurisdictions that fall underneath that county umbrella. To put that into perspective, um, the magnitude of that, I manage about $2 billion in deposits and oversee three divisions that um, do over 2 million transactions a year um, to the tune of about 100 to $200 million in value each week. Um, that is an awesome responsibility and I take it seriously. And it requires experience. Not just experience in accounting, but experience in the actual banking um, structures throughout the county. So um, I am uh, asking for your vote and I, my message is straightforward. Experience, perspective, uh, and integrity. Um, and with that, I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you both for your introductions. Um, we'll start with the first question. What is the first issue you want to address if you are elected? And we'll start with Chris. All right, the, fir uh, the first issue. Um, we have um, an IT issue um, throughout the county and um, within the treasurer's office itself. Um, if you've been following um, the county um, management, if you've been uh, noticing the Board of Supervisors, there's been talk of them replacing their ERP system. This is wide, um, wide ranging um, and it is a monumental project and it has cost a lot of money. But it was necessary because the product that they're using is at the end of life. It was a commercial product, the vendor no longer supported it, so it was out of date. We currently don't have that issue in the treasurer's office because we use a proprietary system. In fact, the three largest counties in the state all use proprietary systems. Pinal County and has their system, and they have actually teamed up with Maricopa County to use it, and this. The problem with the off-the-shelf products that many of the smaller counties use is they don't have control over it. While our system might not have the bells and whistles that a commercial product does, we're never in danger of not being able to fix it, nor of it going end of life and creating a massive cost and um, turmoil in order to have to replace it in any given time frame. Thank you. The same question, Brian. What is the first issue you want to address if you were elected? Well, the first issue I want to address is uh, related very closely to what Mr. Ackerley had said, um, that there is IT issues. And uh, one of them that I have identified is, is that there's a lack of integration between, for in the property tax administration, between the uh, recorder, the assessor, and the treasurer's office. And from my experience, uh, especially having sat the last three years on the Arizona State Board of Equalization, as a hearing officer, I heard the frustrations from the taxpayers 
in their appeals. And there are, there are many very good off-the-shelf products that can actually solve this all-government um, process and for, for that. And I would want to begin to implement that for a number of reasons uh, to help facilitate the service of the treasurer's office. So for example, if you have a commercial property that goes and uh, has a sale that involves a split or a combo or whatever, what happens is it takes six, seven, eight months for that process to go through. In the meantime, we don't have real accurate information about who owes what. And then what generally happens is somebody wins, somebody loses, and we have an appeal. So I would like to fix that. Thank you. And this time we'll start with you. Um, how are property taxes processed in Pima County? And do you think there is a more effective way to process them? Yes. Right now, right now we have uh, a, a system, like I was just explaining in my last answer, that's very disjointed. In other words, the, uh, the property records come from the uh, recorder's office and then the assessor has them and creates an assessment role and values the property. Then it goes to our county finance department where the tax assembly or the tax role is, is put together and they send you your tax statements. And then finally the collection comes from the treasurer's office. Now, and I just want you to know that Pima County is the only one in which the county treasurer does not do the tax roll. Um, so I think one of the problems that we have in this disjointed system is, is that we, when we're trying to move the data from one to the other to the other to the other, it doesn't really work as well as we would like it to. So that's essentially how the system works. How it can be improved can be improved, like I had already mentioned, with uh, a, an integrated data system that we can make the process seamless. Thank you. OK. Chris, how would your our property taxes <laughs> process? Property taxes. I, I, I want to go back and address an issue that you raised, which is the issue with information um, uh, about splits and um, combinations um, and potentially change of ownership. Um, that is an issue, but by statute, that information is housed in the assessor's office, right? So the, the fix to that problem lies in the, the assessor's um, office. And it has gotten substantially better in the time that I've been there. Um, and you did mention that, um, that we are the, st uh, the county that the treasurer doesn't do the tax calculations. And that is true. The employees that do that are not assigned to our office. But I can definitely assure you that the collaboration between the assessor's office, the tax assembly um, um, employees who now have actually been split, some of them are actually housed in the assessor's office, some of them are housed in county administration, and our office, including our IT staff, have been intimately involved in the process throughout the entire uh, process between getting the assessor's role through tax assembly to the Board of Supervisors and then to our office. Um, and over the last two, three years, it has flown, it has, it has progressed without a hitch. Thank you. Okay, let's start with Chris this time. How would you invest public monies? All right, so this is where I disagree with, with um, Brian qu quite a bit. I view my job, uh, and when I mentioned perspective in my, um, in my opening statement, what I meant by that is I will never forget that it is your money that I am the steward of. My job is to make sure that that money is safe, to make sure that we have the money to cover the county's bills and all of the school districts and all of the fire districts and, and, and so forth, and then get the best return on it that I can. End of story, right? My job is administrative. This position is not a public policy setting position. It is 
it is a full-time administrative job. Um, so what we look at first is the security. And actually, to be honest with you, by statute, we have to invest in secure investments. The second part of that is, is the cash management. Now, uh, <clears throat> we'll probably get into that a little bit later, but, and then the third thing is, is getting the best, best return on the, on the investment. And in that order. Okay. Okay, same question. Okay, all right. So um, this is one of one of my um, basically one of my platform issues is that how we invest our money. So I want to give you a good example about the difference in value. How we how we actually look at value and value sometimes isn't always in dollars and cents. So I came to think of well, is there a practical example? And one was uh, back when I was still working in the county, in the county finance department, was when we had a, um, a, a judicial um, appeal for the now defunct Green Valley Hospital that became the, you know, the Santa Cruz Regional Valley Hospital and whatever. And that, w that um, case was filed in December of 2019 and they were seeking relief basically from property taxes. So the only way they can get relief is obviously through the value because that's the only really adjustable um, element of it. So what happened then was by the time we got the case, we're looking at the spring of 2020 and COVID hit. And when we sat down, we looked at what is the value of that hospital? Not the assessor's market value, but what is the value to the community? And we decided to grant that relief and that's where we look at value in different ways in dollars and cents. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to start with you this time, Brian. What can be done about hacking and prevention so the county is not held ransom? Hacking and... Oh. I, that is uh, another one of the reasons why I want to get... A, I would want to get away from our... Uh, in-house uh, data systems and so on because I don't think that we have the resources and can afford literally to hire the expertise that can provide the amount of security that we can get from a major software vendor and that to me is one of the main reasons Besides, besides actually the efficiency and um, of these software um, systems, it's also the security because, you know, it's just almost impossible for us to be able to match what goes on out there at such an alarming rate. And they're trying to hack data systems. Now, thankfully, I'm, I'm sure uh, Pima County hasn't been really um, hacked that severely, but it's possible. And as long as we don't have really secure systems, we're, we're vulnerable. Thank you. Now, Chris, same question. Do you need me to read? Yeah, no, I, I got it. Thank you. And, and I'm going to have to disagree with Ryan here because um, what it shows is, is um, and, and granted, he's not in the office, so he doesn't know the, the structure of it. Because we use a proprietary system, it is isolated. Any commercial vendor is going to have their systems web hosted. They don't host them locally. They host them over the internet. Our system is not. Our system is internal. It is a network within a network with a gap between the outside world. The way we transfer information between the various systems in the county um, and the school districts and whatnot um, provides a gap, right, so that nobody directly interfaces with us. And we do that internally in our office so that it is, no system is entirely safe, right? But given the fact that we are able to isolate the, the system within a network, within a network, with all of those very me measures, gives us a very high confidence that 
we um, have the best security scenario that we we can we can imagine right now. Okay, this time we'll start with Brian. And what changes, if any, do you think are needed within the department, the Treasurer's Department? Uh, starting with me or Brian? Oh, I thought it was with Brian, but it, did I make a mistake? Yeah. Should it be Chris? Yeah. It's okay, I'm sorry. We'll start with Chris. <laughs> My mistake. Uh, I'm only human. What changes, if any, do you think are needed within the department? Um, I believe that our department um, needs to do, uh, uh, the treasurer's office needs to do a little bit better job of constituent outreach. Um, uh, I, I love Beth to death. Um, she was an accountant, right? Um, and she, um, uh, she viewed her role in, in that office as basically the, the chief, uh, chief accountant for that office. Uh, as I said, I'm a high school math and physics teacher. Um, I, I picked up the accounting, although um, I, I'm gonna geek out here for a bit, but um, they seem to ignore reference frames all the time. And I get on them and um, uh, my accounting supervisor gets on me when I say, oh, this is not rocket science. But I get it, um, and, so, um, and, I, and so I understand that. So I think we need to do a better, uh, a better job of constituent outreach and constituent, um, answering constituents' questions before they ask them um, and, and doing a little bit more uh, public interfacing. Okay, now your turn. <laughs> Okay, yes, um, my major change would also be with that focus on providing good service to the citizens and taxpayers, like I said, including those who, taxpayers who were not citizens of the county. And, and what I would envision is not only having that integrated data system, like I said, with the other departments like the assessor and the recorder, so that we can actually answer questions without sending them to all different departments when they call. So if we had that, and I plan on building an actual team, a department with inside the treasurer's office that is strictly devoted to going out and not only providing service to homeowners who might have questions, but especially to our commercial businesses. And they're the ones who are looking for, they want property tax information in terms of their planning and development. That's a, an important aspect for them. I know I have actually, when I, when I worked before in the county finance and when I worked in the assessor's office, that was a major thing. And I got to know a number of the developers and so on uh, through the Urban Land Institute and other organizations. And that's the stuff that they need to have out of our office. Okay, thank you, Chris. I, I just answered the question. Oh, no, I'm, I'm the next question. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm really having trouble today. That's okay. Too few of you. <laughs> okay. Will you commit to adopting an investment policy that adopts climate crisis and diversity, equity, and inclusion into risk and, and analysis? Okay. So, so when I, when I said in my opening remarks that I wanted an in investment uh, policy from the Board of Supervisors. They haven't had one since 1995. Their last investment policy was in 1992, and then it exp expired in 1995. So that's almost 30 years we have not had an actual policy. So as far as um, uh, ESG, uh, ratings and so on for our investments and climate resiliency and so on. I think those are all inculcated in our prosperity initiative. And that's why my proposal would be to have an investment policy that I, I would make and bring to the board and say, let's adopt a policy now that's in alignment and serves the pros county's prosperity initiative. And that would bring in all of the 
element of DEI, all of the elements of climate resiliency. There's no reason not why now we should be having money invested in Chevron, to be honest with you. And the, the, we do have money invested in there. And, you know, we have to look out for our future. Thank you. Thank you. Chris. So, county warrants were uh, $6.3 million, a little bit more than that on Thursday. Um, and the checking account balance will be just a little bit north of $34 million um, uh, on, on Monday when I get in. And I know that not because I thought, oh, I'm going to a forum, I should ask somebody, but because I did the cash flow analysis on Friday. Um, uh, the gentleman who sits at our banking desk was, it was his day off on Friday, and um, I, as treasurer, am expected to fill in and do all of those critical roles within the office if somebody is, is taking off because we have a relatively small staff. Now, I bring that up because to the point, only very small percentage of our portfolio right now is invested in corporate bonds and when we have conversations with our investment manager about those bonds it's about the maturity so that it fits into our cash flow model and it's about it's about the rate of re return on the other side we have about a hundred and sixty million dollars in um, CDs because much of the money that we invest has to be invested in full faith and credit. And so we buy CDs of less than 250, so we get under FDI insurance. That means that we have, I believe, north of like 600 CDs. The idea that somebody is going to evaluate those more on more than maturity and rate means that we'd have to hire a lot more staff. Thank you. Now we'll start with you on this question. What is involved in the appeals process, particularly when people can't afford their taxes? And would you make any changes to the appeals process? Is that question to me first or Brian? You first. Okay, so um, the, the, you can appeal the assessment. There are very limited circumstances that you can uh, do anything, have a case against the taxes. You appeal the assessments, and that is handled by the assessor's office. Our office does not get involved in that. Now, occasionally, right, it, the, the assessor's office has deadlines, and I'm sure Brian can speak to those deadlines a lot, a lot more knowledgeably than I can because they, he did work in the assessor's office. In the treasurer's office, we don't handle any of that. What we will occasionally do is get involved with abating taxes for some reason or another. Typically, somebody will have applied to the assessor's office and realize they have an exemption, but they're only uh, allowed to go back a certain number of years, so if it exceeds that needs to go back further that needs to be an abatement but we don't get to make that the treasurer's office does not get to make that decision on their own um, that is a board of supervisors decision so the only thing that our office does when we're presented a case like that from the assessors or the um, uh, county administration we can then recommend to the board that they abate the taxes and then the board of supervisors has to um, has to approve that. That is not our office's responsibility. Okay, thank you. Brian. Uh, yes, Mr. Eckley is absolutely correct about um, that the assessor handles the appeals process. And that's because the, the two elements that create your property tax are the value and the rate, which is derived from the levy from the different taxing jurisdictions and you can't appeal the levies so but your rate but your value can be appealed but le let me just say from my experience on the state board of equalization when people when especially homeowners and small business people come they're appealing their taxes and that's why even in, in judicial appeals it goes to the Arizona um, the state uh, Arizona tax court, okay? So having that knowledge, uh, so w the treasurer can't do anything except they don't, 
even seem to be able to make the tax roll corrections when, when there is refunds due, then they have to write the checks. But other than that, there's really not much the treasurer can do except to be able to inform people more about how the property tax system works and give them that information and relieve some of that frustration from them. Thank you. Now it's your turn to go first, Brian. Okay. What is the Prosperity Initiative? Okay, the, the Prosperity Initiative was adopted by uh, the Board of Supervisors last December. And um, basically what it is, is it's a plan that I guess it modeled after the Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan, which was highly successful. And it's a long-term um, comprehensive plan in which to create generational wealth community wealth and generational wealth so that we we don't we can eliminate poverty in, in many of our communities within the county and it's the idea is so everything involved in that it involves housing it involves climate and it involves um, uh, basically workforce development and so on to to create that type of a, a of a economic environment in which we can get generational wealth. Uh, I I think it's a, a beautiful program. I really endorse it. I think the board of supervisors did a tremendous job with that, and especially and the county administrator. So that's why I want to support that with our investment policy as well. So. Thank you. Yeah. Chris? It, a, a, as I mentioned before, uh, for 22 years I taught high school physics and math. Um, and for the vast, vast majority of my career, I taught at-risk students um, in low socioeconomic areas under exceedingly difficult situations. Um, I absolutely understand my opponent's um, desire to be an advocate um, for a, a lot of the, the issues that he brought up. Um, and I was a fierce advocate for education um, you know, to the frustration of many of my colleagues um, in, in the legislature um, because I did not toe the party line um, and was, was a fierce advocate. So I absolutely understand that advocacy. But that's not my job. My job is to make sure that every two weeks the teachers get paid. Um, and that requires that the the um, the banking and investment um, portfolio um, allow that to happen and focus on managing the cash flow of the county, not on affecting um, social and environmental policy. While I understand the need for it, and if, um, if um, um, Mr. Johnson was running for legislature or board of supervisors or Senate or Congress, I, I can absolutely applaud that. But that's not this job. OK. Now we'll start with Chris on this one. How will you protect taxpayer money for the future? I, 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 absolutely. That is the key thing. And, and in fact, it goes a little bit more than that. As I said, evaluating and making sure that the, the portfolio and the money is um, diversified and that, um, you know, that we're, we're managing it um, managing it safely and getting the best return we can about hedging against future stuff. All, all of the geeky stuff that you, you see on, you know, a, a business channel w when you're watching it. Um, but more importantly, it's about, re as I said, remembering that it's your money, right? And so while my position doesn't create public policy, it is an interpretation of statute sometimes. And I will always make that interpretation to the benefit of the taxpayer. <coughs> I will always make that determination to the benefit of the taxpayer whenever statute allows. Okay, Brian. The way we look at protecting the money in the future, well, first let me just say that as far as the handling of the money, the state does audit, the treasurer's office audits the all the county financial departments and audits even the attorney's office audits everybody um, so that and there are statutes that more or less 
bake in the safety and the liquidity of the money, the property tax money that is collected. Okay, so when we look at that, how do we protect it for the future? Well, it's how we use it for the future that's more important. It's we're going to get taxes every year. They're going to come in every uh, October and every May, April, and we're going to, and it's going to be a constant flow. But how we use it to go and 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 invest that into the future is how we protect the value of that money in the future. So as far as the safety and liquidity is concerned, well, that's statutory. We've got to follow the rules. We do. Everybody will follow the rules. But how we use it to get it further down in the future is um, how, basically how we look at our future and how we want it to be. Thank you. The League of Women Voters of Greater Tucson, thank you, our audience, for taking part in educating yourselves on the issues and individuals. And now let us thank our candidates for their performance in today's forum. Thank you. Now, we have 30 minutes left. And so we want to do something unique that we've never done before. We're going to ask Gabriella, the recorder, to come up and let us let the three of them just sort of talk about the future. Do we have closing statements? Oh, I'm sorry. I am, I'm so flabbergasted by the lack of audience, I guess, that I forgot to allow them their closing statement. So because Brian started with the opening statement, we'll let Chris close as the first one. Well, thank you. So. I, I am your county treasurer. Um, I look very much look forward to continuing um, uh, continuing in that position. As I said, uh, for 22 years, I, I, I taught physics and math mostly to um, at-risk students. Um, it was that uh, um, advocacy for education issues that led me into politics. Um, I served a term in the state legislature um, as a as um, and. <clears throat> and so uh, about three years ago, um, Beth asked me, um, would you consider coming to my office and learning the job so that you can take over when I retire? And I thought about it for a bit and it's like, okay, so for 22 years I taught students to solve problems with math. Now I get to solve problems with math every day. And so I geek out. This job is about experience. It's about perspective, um, and it's a, it's about it's about integrity. This is a job. Many weeks, fifty plus hours. Job. It is it is a full time job. It is not a public policy pos um, position. It, it is administrative position, and I I love every minute of it. So I'm asking the voters. I have the experience to do the job. I won't forget that it's your money, um, and for 22 years you trusted me with your children. Now I'm asking you to trust me with your money, so I'm asking for your vote to continue doing, doing the work that I do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Brian Johnson. Okay, I, I talked about service in my opening remarks. An attitude is an element of service, and that pervades its delivery and the satisfaction level of its outcome. And my attitude stands in clear contrast to that of the incumbent. I want to share with you some quotes from the Pima County Treasurer's website. It's on the general page um, that deals with uh, information about property taxes. So the one statement um, I first want to bring out is Pima County Mail's tax statements. And like we had mentioned earlier, that the property tax statements don't come from the treasurer. They are prepared with the, and the tax roll in the county finance department. Um, so, so it seems kind of weird what follows then. And, and, and this is a direct quote right from their website. It says, please be advised that the law does not require the treasurer or the county to send tax notices. Now, that's a true statement, but think about that. What does that say about your attitude towards your statutory responsibility of collecting the taxes? How would people know, right? 
I mean, I don't even know why that statement is in there. And then the one that I think is really a killer, and 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 it's in this statement that's also currently on the county website, and it says tax statements are sent as, to taxpayers as a courtesy. Now. Those statements show you the current treasurer's attitude about serving you. I understand the responsibilities of the treasurer's office. I don't require a statute to tell me to serve the citizens. And my attitude toward service is that's a responsibility. So vote for Brian Johnson. You'll get a treasurer who will work for you and serve you. And I'll be courteous, too. So thank you. We're going to have a pretty informal few minutes here talking about what all three of them see as the future for Pima County <coughs> and the roles they're going to play and if anything what big things they see in the future for us. So why don't we let Gabrielle introduce herself. Skoktash everyone. Um, Anya, can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> no? No. Anya Nipjogi Gabriela Casares Kelly Pesimo Ochkop Kamjur, and you would Kapima Chukshan Oha Handam. Hi, everybody. I'm Gabriela Casares Kelly. I'm from the communities of Pesimo and Kup, which are located on the Thonotham Nation, and I serve as your elected county recorder since January of 2021. Introduction and a great one. <laughs> so, I guess let's just start with Chris and we'll let him start out what he sees the future and what, what's going to be out there and what. Uh, if I might, though, um, um, Mr. Johnson um, made some, um, uh, I, I, I don't know how, how to categorize them, but some, uh, uh, let me say that some connections that maybe need a little bit exploring. He was upset that, first of all, I have not updated the website yet. The website, just replace my picture, it's the exact same website. We're probably gonna do that before the next um, um, tax season rolls around, but it's still the same website that has been there for however many years. Second of all, yes, some of the statute is very harsh, and in fact, we send out those pink notices on delinquent taxes, and they're very, very harsh. But they're statute, and the problem is, is if we don't put that statement on the website, then people will call us and say, I didn't get the notices, so I shouldn't have to pay the interest. Well, there's no provision in statute that allows me, nor the Board of Supervisors, nor for that matter, anybody in the state to waive the interest because you didn't get receive the tax bill. Now, we send out all of the tax bills to everybody um, um, in September. Right? Um, but there are issues with ownership information. There's stuff that gets lost in the mail. It ends up um, going to the wrong property. And so what we can't give the perception of is that the law requires delivery of a tax statement in order for the taxes and then or interest to be due. Now we've I've had discussions with legislatures about looking at those uh, looking at those statutes that we might put some leeway in there but at the end of at the end of the day it comes down to there there has to be a balance between the cost of doing mechanisms like that um, and the, the gain that it gets. Now that's an unfortunate situation and I understand and I totally agree that those messages are very, very, very harsh. But they don't reflect our attitude of service. They reflect what's written in the statute. And as a governmental organization, we have to explain to taxpayers what the law is. Okay, now, on a brighter no. side, what do you see in the future? future? What big things coming down for you? I'd be happy to. What's that? If you wanted to respond to that, I'd be happy to. No, it's and I and I realize that 
those statements have been in there for a long time. They were there years ago, and, 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 it, and it used to bother me because when I worked in, in the county finance and, and a lot of times I had to work with the treasurer's office and I didn't work for the treasurer's office but I had to work with the treasurer's office and, and I felt that attitude for a long time. And Mr. Ackerley wasn't there then at that time but I think that's been the pervasive attitude that I have gotten from them over the years. Yeah, we're friends now. We are. Yes. We are. Okay. Now. Future. 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 All right. So going into the going into the future. Um, like I said, um, Beth was a CPA. I am not. I'm a teacher, right? Um, and so I want to make a concerted effort to have the office do constitu constituent outreach. Um, I also there are as as uh, Mr. Johnson alluded to, uh, there are many inconsistencies in statute that create confusion um, and can sometimes be harsh and there might be a way to moderate that. Um, with my um, uh, having served in the legislature and still having a relationship there, I would like to work on curbing some of those edges and making some of the statutes more consistent, more understandable, um, and um, make more sense quite frankly um, and <clears throat> so I see those those two areas the other thing that is coming up is that we have a as mentioned we have a proprietary system in the treasurer's office and it is due for a refresh um, I am totally of the mindset right now that we need to keep it a proprietary system because the treasurers and the other counties that are using the off-the-shelf products are pulling their hairs out because they don't work well. Um, and so um, I think we need to do that, but that is a major project. It will be a major undertaking. But let's put this in perspective. As I mentioned, the counties has replaced their ERP system. They will have spent upwards of $30 million to do it, right? We handle the same transactions that they handle it. Our entire budget, and that covers everything we do, is $3 million. By adding two or three more developers to my IT team, we can accomplish that goal of refreshing our system to add some of the bells and whistles into it um, and, and keep the county functioning and interface with all of the different other jurisdictions. So that's a major project I'm looking for. Well, I shouldn't know that, say that I'm necessarily looking forward to doing it, but I'm looking forward to the challenge in the upcoming term. Yeah, well, mine will be a little bit of a horse of a different color. Um, so looking forward to um, advancements in the recorder's office. As you know, my office oversees voter registration, early voting, and document recording. And we've had really great success um, with, the, the, with integration of technology. One of the biggest things that we did in, in 2021 was we implemented electronic poll books. Um, that means we replaced paper poll books, um, which made it so that only people could vote in only their precinct. They showed up to the library instead of the church where they were assigned. Um, that person would be issued a provisional ballot, and ultimately that provisional ballot, if it was considered out of precinct, would not be counted. We have just seen um, a, a congressional race in Maricopa County, um, Raquel Tehran um, and Yasmin Ansari, that was decided by 39 votes. 39 for a congressional district race. Um, so when we say that every vote matters and is important, um, we really do mean that. And so by implementing electronic poll books, that means that instead of having big binders with pages and pages of people's names that you're either on the list or not on the list and you're flipping through, um, we switched to the electronic poll book, which is an, is an iPad-like uh, function. And now every 630,000 registered voters that are in Pima County are all on the list. And that show, uh, showed a dramatic reduction in the number of provisional ballots issued, we went from 18,000 to around 2,500. And the majority of those were people who had never been registered um, or who maybe were in a different county. Sometimes we have people who are close to county lines who come in um, or, or situations like that. <clears throat> that means 
Anyone can vote anywhere. Any Tucsonan can vote all the way to Ajo, Cells. They can go up to Mount Lemmon. If they're, if they're there on election day, they can vote there. Um, and so it makes it very convenient and, again, um, helps more of those votes count. Uh, we have also... Um, done a number of, of upgrades. One of the big upgrades that we're looking at <clears throat> in 2025 is changing simply the way that we mail out ballots. Um, one big thing is we currently use two separate envelopes, a white envelope and a yellow envelope. And sometimes we get ballots in the yellow envelope instead of the white envelope, which requires a signature. And we have to make phone calls and talk to people and explain to them why they sent in the wrong thing and why we can't accept their ballot. Well, we sent it in, yes, but you sent it in the wrong envelope. And that is something that is a barrier to people. Um, you know, somebody with low vision or somebody um, with, uh, you know, reading comprehension or, or, or anything else like that, um, they're going to maybe struggle or, or maybe if you're just confused and your kids are coming at you while you're trying to vote, <laughs> whatever the situation. So we will be working towards a one envelope solution. That envelope is your affidavit. You sign the envelope and it's also the return envelope. And that way there's less confusion about that. And bonus, we get to save on uh, paper and it saves us money and it also helps the environment. Um, so it's a wonderful solution. And for those who are like, oh wait, so the signature is going to be visible on the back? Well, we're when we're mailing things, we're trusting the U.S. government services. We're trusting the United States Postal Service, which is a wonderful service. We could not do what we do in early voting. 80% of all voters participate in early voting by mail um, in, in the state. And without that partnership, um, you know, that would be a challenge. So um, number one, of course, it's going from a government entity to another government entity, um, which we which we appreciate, but for those who feel uncomfortable with that, we will establish ballot drop boxes so that people can drop it off and we're directly going to be receiving those. Um, and so that's something that we're really looking forward to um, in 2025. Um, the other thing is, there's been quite a bit of conversation about our role as partisan elected and whether or not we're able to um, impact legislation. Um, I think that is a very serious part of our role. Um, we are constantly having conversations with the Arizona Association of Counties. We're talking with our lobbyists there, um, with the county um, to alert them, especially since there's been an attack on voting rights. And there's been so much that even though I am not a, a writer of legislation, I can impact that by lobbying my um, legislators and pushing for them um, to to highlight something or to, to show concern, um, particularly in this elevated um, time frame where, where there is so much distrust in election. Um, the same can be said on the congressional federal level as well, um, passing legislation such as the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and, and things like that. We need to be out there and vocal and talking about these issues so that if, if we are not being the squeaky wheel it, we're never going to get the grease. So we have to be out there talking about these things. And so I think they are very partisan. Us showing our values and concern for the environment and, and concern for um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, those are part of our prerogative um, as office holders. And we can incorporate that within policies within our hiring practices, um, which my office did. Um, we have spent a lot of time trying to ensure that that we are, that our hiring practices are equitable, um, and that we're we're recruiting um, a population that is reflective of the community it serves, and that is something that's very important. Um, that's a commitment to things like, pro, you know, having. Um, na native Spanish speakers able to answer the phones or respond to uh, a constituent uh, by email um, in in Spanish. You know those kinds of things are, are really important, and I think those are very much within um, our control as administrators within within the office. And as Chris said, we it is 50 hours a week, 60 hours sometimes, um, but. 
you know, that, that is within um, our control and then pushing for that legislation that will support those changes that are directly impacting our constituencies. Uh, I think that is also very important. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to go back in, in the past a little bit before I go into the future. When I first started working for Pima County, it was back in 2006. And, you, and I got very involved with the union that represented the county employees, SEIU. So I got to meet a lot of my fellow employees from all the different departments uh, around the county, whether they were from you know, parks and rec or roads and you know, everything. So I, it, it was a great experience. And you know, we had 11,000 Pima County employees back then in 2006. And then the Great Recession happened and property values just went down and bottomed out. And what happened was we went from 11,000 to 7,000 employees overnight practically. And what really happened was we kind of lost the pride we even had in the service that we provided because we couldn't do it. We just didn't, couldn't do it anymore. We didn't, there weren't enough people there were to, to keep that level that we had prior to that great recession. But now in the future, the way I see it, I mean, Pima County is booming. Tucson is booming. Marana is booming, right? You see all the new construction going on out there? It's amazing. We've gotten a property tax base that's increasing and increasing. We need to get back to that level of service that the county provides its constituents that we had, I think, prior to the Great Recession. And, and that's what I look forward to, to doing, to being a part of again. And, and, and I have a lot of optimism that we could get there because I know we can afford it now. Really, we can. Don't let anybody tell you we can't. Just look at, just look at you know these huge um, industrial properties going up on the freeway up in Marana, or um, or out on the east side in the Port of Tucson and so on. So I, I I'm very optimistic that we're going to have a great future, and I'd like to see more that our services expand and that we do more for the people of the constituency of the Pima County. Well, again, thank you, all three of you. Yeah. And the League of Women Voters really appreciate you taking the effort to speak today. And we want to thank you all again for being well, thank here. Thank you. Thank you.